Hey, today we're going to be talking about the disease of the integumentary system. That's diseases of the skin. We're going to be talking about that in relation to a number of different species. The skin makes up the largest organ system of the body. Remember that from our previous lecture. It comprises 24% of the total body weight of a newborn puppy and about 12% of the body weight of an adult uh, animal. So it's really important. We talked about the three distinct layers uh, last lecture, the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis, or subcuticular layer. Um, again, go back to your anatomy and physiology book uh, to go over the exact function of those layers. You know that the skin serves as a barrier between the animal's body and the environment. It not only protects the animal from physical, chemical, and microbiological injury, but it's the sensory organs within the skin that allow the animals to feel pain, heat, cold, touch, and pressure. The skin is also a storage depot for electrolytes, water, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, and it assists in the activation of vitamin D by solar energy. So the functions, uh, just uh, briefly again, the hypodermis stores fat for insulation and energy reserves. And the animal's skin has as many functions. We talked about in the previous lecture about those uh, basically, but it's, a, it's an enclosing barrier. So it protects the internal environment of the body from water and electrolyte loss. Also um, environmental protection uh, against, it protects the internal environment from the external environment. Temperature regulation helps to maintain the animal's coat and uh, regulates the body's supply to the cutaneous tissues, which regulate heat dissipation and retention. Sensory perception, remember we talked about um, very special uh, cells within the skin um, that sense uh, there's tactile hairs and then there's Meissner's corpuscles and Pacinian corpuscles. They're all cells that uh, help to detect certain um, touches, uh, light touches versus pressure. Um, so we have organs for touch, temperature, and pain within the skin. Um, motion and shape allows for motion and provides a definition to the body. If we didn't have skin, we'd be a blob. We also have antimicrobial properties within the skin, um, certain an uh, antimicrobial and antifungal uh, properties. Also blood pressure control, the peripheral vascular beds within the skin help to control blood pressure. Secretion, um, the skin contains both apocrine and sebaceous glands. Adnexa, which is uh, what produces the hair, the nails, the hooves, and the horny layers of the epidermis. Storage, again, stores electrolytes, water, vitamins, fat, proteins, carbohydrates, and other uh, substances. Also um, has pigmentation, so processes within the skin, for example, melanin formation and where that melanin is placed within the melanocyte helps to determine coat and skin color and provide solar protection. Excretion, the skin, animal skin does excrete certain uh, toxins and um, medications uh, through the, uh, the glands of the skin. And again, we talked about vitamin D production and how it's essential for the, for the solar energy to be um, uh, activating the vitamin D, which is necessary for normal calcium absorption. So some quick pictures of the skin. Uh, you'll remember this diagram um, and, a, and a slide of uh, a piece of skin. Um, some terms that you need to know in relationship to problems that we may have um, when looking at the skin. A wheel, if you look at the top left picture, is a raised red lesion. Um, think of a wheel, W-H-E-A-L, as looking like a wheel, W-H-E-E-L-E. Um, it's circular, um, it's, it's large, um, and it is raised. A pustule is a pus-filled small sac. A papule is a pus-filled um, small sacs that are, are grouped together. A nodule is a firm growth on top of the skin. A macule is a round lesion round like the wheel, but it is flat and sometimes scaly around the outside. Miliary dermatitis or folliculitis are blackheads, and uh, they occur in groups, usually large groups of little blackheads. And here's an example of that. So wheel, pustule, nodule, macule, papule, and miliary dermatitis, folliculitis, you should know what those look like so that you can describe them. Or when I am describing a lesion, 
you'll be able to understand what that looks like. Important for you to know, the skin is an important indicator of internal disease. So something that's happening on the skin can sometimes mirror something that's happening within the body. Any physical condition that disrupts the normal functions of this barrier can result in disease. So that's increased moisture, chemical exposure, increased temperature, hormonal change, and physical damage can produce a breach in that barrier. And that allows the invasion of disease producing microorganisms. Problems relating to the skin are the most frequent complaints presented in small animals, uh, in, in small animal medicine. I, and I would argue that it is one of the most frustrating for both the clinician and the owner, not to mention the pet. Technicians deal with these com complaints daily as clients ask questions and seek help for treatment and prevention of skin diseases afflicting their pets. I'm going to give you some things to watch, uh, things that you can say to clients, um, and some, some uh, expectations that you need to set with clients when they're dealing with a skin condition. We're going to start by talking about ectoparasites. Ectoparasites are external parasites um, that are responsible for many skin problems seen in small animal medicine. Most common ectoparasites that you will need to remember, ear mites called Ododectes cynotus, fleas, tenosophilides, uh, I'll have to try to say this, tenosophilides species, and there are several species of fleas. I will tell you right now that the most common species that we see on any animal is the cat flea. Uh, ticks, there are lots of different varieties of ticks and ticks carry lots of different diseases. Mange, mange is a general term for a number of different mites that live on top of or within the skin. Demodex, Cercoptes scabii, and Noda edris cati. Warbles, or hypoderma derma species, these are maggots that live within the skin and it's part of their life cycle. So a fly lays an egg in the skin of an animal. That egg grows up within the skin, develops a little breathing hole so that it can get oxygen um, but eventually emerges from the skin and becomes a, uh, a fly. Myasis is the term we use for fly maggots that generally, generally live on top of the skin and um, eat usually dead tissue. Once they run out of dead tissue, they will move to live tissue, um, but it is generally a disease of neglect. Lice is also another disease of neglect, Linonathus cytosis, and there are a couple of different types of lice. Most important thing to remember about lice is that it is species specific, meaning that if I, if I have a horse with lice, I cannot get that lice, but it can be contagious to other horses. So some of these parasites live on the skin, some live within or under the skin, some pierce the skin, sucking blood meals that produce severe cutaneous reactions. And these reactions include inflammation, edema, and itching. In many cases, the animal itself is responsible for increased damage to the skin through licking, chewing, and scratching. So when we're talking about skin, not only do we have the issue of um, the skin condition itself, but we also have the issue of what's happened as a result of the skin condition. That's why it can be hard to diagnose. Ear mites, Ododectes cynodes. Clinical signs, ear canals may be filled with brown, black, crusty exudate, kind of a waxy, nasty uh, looking stuff, and there tends to be a lot of it. Mites are extremely irritating, so animals are gonna scratch their ears. Um, you'll see scrapes or wounds on the side of the face or the head because they're scratching <clears throat> so hard. Um, we can see these with an otoscope looking directly into the ear. We can see large white adult mites kind of crawling around on the surface of the crusty exudate. We can also see these things microscopically. Um, if we take a smear of that exudate and put it in mineral oil, we'll be able to see the mites um, swimming around and sometimes even eggs uh, within the um, microscopic uh, view. Um, the reason we know how irritating this is to animals is that there was a clinician who um, actually gave himself ear mites, and he said that it was like constant chewing in his ears, and it was extremely itchy. 
So we know how, uh, or he knows how um, difficult it is to live with these ear mites. Um, technicians should first carefully clean the exudate from the ear canal, then apply a miticide, something that will kill the mite into the canal. Um, we can use a couple of different types of miticides. There's something called Trezoderm, which is a mix of medications, thiabendazole, neomycin, and dexamethasone. It is a medication that can be used for fungal or yeast infections and bacteria as well. It's important when we give the Trezoderm that they use it for at least three weeks because that's the life cycle of the mite. It will kill only the adult mite. So you can kill the adult mite, but if you don't use it for three weeks, then those eggs that have hatched and are growing into the adult mite stage at three weeks, you'll be able to kill them again. But if you stop at about two weeks, you're gonna ha still have a mite infection. Another one would be something called otomite. It's piperinol uh, butoxide. It's actually an insecticide or a miticide. Um, and that typically only needs to be given once and occasionally, again, in two to three weeks. Ivermectin is a commonly used parasiticide. We use it for lots of different parasites. We can use it for off-label use, which means we have to um, uh, talk with the client, let them know that they, it's never been tested for this, but it's commonly used for this. So the, remember, tell the client, the life cycle is of the parasite is three weeks. Eggs hatch every 10 days, so treatment must be continued for no less than 30 days. So we usually do it at least for three weeks, if not for 30 days. Parasite is highly contagious, and all animals that have had contact with the infested animal should be treated. Humans do not become infested with this parasite in most cases. There was an instance where that clinician did infect himself or infest himself. He actually had to take a Q-tip and put it into his ear. So it's very difficult to do that uh, typically. Mites may spend time elsewhere on the cat's and the animal's bodies, but especially on the cat's tail. So if you've got reinfestations going on, if you treat the entire animal with a dip or a shampoo, sometimes you that's what's needed in order to get completely rid of it. Most commonly seen in cats, but dogs can get it as well. Stenocephalides species, this is um, uh, cat fleas most commonly, um, they're blood-sucking ectoparasites that feed sporadically on mammals and birds. So they, they can attack any animal. Um, fleas produce severe skin irritation as a result of their frequent bites. Flea saliva is highly antigenic, which means it has lots of antigens on it, which the animal's antibodies will mount an attack against. So there's an inflammatory response or an allergic dermatitis that can happen with this. One flea in an allergic animal can cause a huge problem with their skin. Fleas can also act as vectors for diseases and as intermediary hosts for the dog tapeworm, Dipolidium caninum. So this uh, flea not only carries diseases, but also if you see a tapeworm, chances are pretty good that this animal has had fleas at some point. But you can only get this tapeworm from eating the flea. So it's not, the tapeworm itself is not contagious, but fleas are. When we have um, fleas on a pet, it's very easy for them to infest the entire environment that, where the pet has been. Um, it can become infested with massive numbers of fleas. So it's really important that we not only treat the pet, but all the pets in the household and the environment. And that includes the car, if they've been in the car at all. So some clinical signs, you should all uh, be familiar with this. Animals that are infested with fleas will continually scratch or bite at their skin, often at the tail head areas, area, so like at the rump, and in the inner thigh of the region, uh, region of the animal. That tends to be the places, those tend to be the places where animals or fleas live. Um, so you're gonna see these areas with red, inflamed, scabbed skin. In cats, a lot of times, mm -hmm. we find small scabs all over the dorsum, the entire dorsum, the, the back of the animal, and very often in the neck region or around the face where it's diff more difficult for them to groom them off. A lot of people say, I've never seen a, cat, a flea on my cat. Well, that's because the cat is constantly um, grooming and is able to groom fleas off of their skin. 
Sometimes we don't see live fleas, but we do see these small pepper-like granules that are found on the skin and the hair coat. Um, if you look at them very closely, they typically look like uh, spirals. If you put them on a white piece of paper and you get it a little bit wet and you smear it, um, it turns orange. And what that means is that this is digested blood. It's dried flea excrement. We call it flea dirt. Um, and you see flea dirt and you absolutely have fleas. You may not see an, a, a live flea on the animal, but if you have flea dirt, you've had fleas for a while, especially see if, if you see a great amount of flea dirt. Several flea products are currently available on the market. Uh, they can be broken down into groups. Some are applied topically through sprays, dips, powders, shampoos. Some are applied systemically, but they can be systemically uh, applied topically as well. So spot ons like Frontline, Advantage, uh, that kind of thing. Or we have oral and in injectable uh, flea products as well. All of these products act at some point in the flea's life cycle to interrupt the development of the adult flea or to repel the adult flea from the animal. If you have an animal that is allergic, one of the best things that you can give that pet owner is something that will repel the flea from even getting on the pet. For your client, you need to sympathize. Most people don't even want to admit to having fleas in their household, but the, but the fact of the matter is that there are fleas everywhere in the environment. And even if you have the cleanest household, the cleanest pet, they can still get fleas. So it's not, it's not something you should be judging at all and treating can be very frustrating. There are a lot of environmental factors, um, geographic locations, for instance, in Ohio, we do see fleas year round, but in, in uh, the winter time, we see less of it in Florida, they have fleas year round um, and it's a major, major problem there. There are also some species sensitivities that uh, affect the development of, of disease. Treatment of the environment is essential in preventing flea infestation. Fleas spend most of their life cycle off of the host. So if you don't treat the environment, you're not treating the problem. If one animal in the house has fleas, they all have fleas. They, the owner will often come in and say, well, this dog always gets fleas and this dog never gets fleas. They're going to say that, but we, we have to remember that it, there's always a chance if there's fleas in the household, everybody's got fleas. Um, so we see flea infestation causing damage to the skin and then other skin problems will develop. The flea will bite and feed on humans if animals are not available. Um, we very rarely have that problem unless we have a huge flea infestation in the house. Some fleas can remain dormant in the environment for months if conditions are suitable. So you need to clean that environment, even if no animal has been there, um, by vacuuming and treating with sprays or foggers. Uh, one story I like to tell is I used to work for a vet who had a hunting cabin up in Wisconsin. And every year what he would do when he went up to the cabin is he would let his dogs run through the cabin first. And by doing so, um, they, uh, their carbon dioxide and the heat of their bodies actually encouraged fleas to hatch and uh, to begin their life cycle. And once they, ha they hatched, it allowed him to kill the larvae by doing a, a flea bomb in the, um, in the cabin. Uh, so he used his, the information that he knew about flea life cycle and their dormancy and then how they hatch in order to be able to treat the property. Some systemic flea medicine. Um, systemics are one of the newest treatments for fleas. Um, they've been around for almost 20 years now, uh, but uh, still relatively new. Um, Advantage, it's probably one of the oldest uh, frontline and Advantage are probably the oldest ones that we've seen. It's a once a month spot on treatment, um, kills adult fleas and prevents reproduction. Um, so if you're using it over time and that and only that, if you don't wanna treat the environment, that eventually will get rid of your flea population. Program or Lufenuron, um, it's absorbed by the fatty tissue and slowly distributed to the bloodstream. Uh, it interferes with the synthesis of chitin, which is necessary element in flea development. Um, it takes 30 to 60 days to reach full effectiveness. So if you have an animal 
with, uh, or you, you can give it orally and you can also give it um, by injection, six month injection to cats. But if you have an animal with flea allergies, this is not the best way to go because adult fleas will still be on the animal uh, until they go through their life cycle and die off and then the, the new, um, new fleas won't grow up. Frontline is like Advantage. It is applied monthly to the skin. The, adva the Advantage to Frontline. Um, Frontline also gets ticks. Sentinel has Lufenuron-like program in it, but it also contains something for heartworm prevention. Um, it is given orally. Revolution is a spot on that kills fleas. It's also used to treat heartworms, ear mites, intestinal uh, parasites, and sarcoptic mange for dogs and cats. Um, so it does treat quite a bit of, um, of, of parasites or insects. Comfortis is an oral medication, has a 30 minute action and it keeps fleas off for one month. You have to feed it with a meal. Um, the active ingredient in Comfortis is Spinosad. Capstar is 30 minute action. It lasts for 24 hours. Uh, its active ingredient is Niten per gram. It is an oral tablet. What's great about this tablet is we like, it's fairly inexpensive. We like to use it instead of using a flea shampoo or a flea dip because the flea dip and the flea shampoo have toxic ingredients that don't last very long. So within hours, um, the eff efficacy is gone. Capstar lasts for 24 hours. You can give, a, give it a bath to get the animal cleaned up. And then tw 24 hours later, you can apply a product like Frontline or um, first, uh, first Shield or Vectra. Um, in order to get the animal a long-term protection. Sprays and powders, there are many products that contain a, a combination of ingredients. Um, they, most of them act to repel or kill the adult flea. Each product has very species specific and age specifications and you need to read the label carefully before use. You've gotta be familiar with the products that are sold in your clinic. Um, if somebody brings you an uh, over-the-counter product read it for them, make sure that they're using it appropriately. I will tell you that most sprays and powders are not effective and a lot of them contain ingredients that, that are very toxic to cats. Shampoos have no residual effect. You put it on, it may kill the fleas that are in contact with the shampoo, but you have to make sure you get everywhere on the body and then you rinse it. Once you've rinsed the, the shampoo off, it is no longer effective. So you want to watch it very um, and, and look very closely at your shampoo and make sure you've combed every, used a flea comb to comb every inch of the animal that you're treating. Uh, dips provide residual effect on the animal. Not a lot of residual effect, but some, but they are more toxic than any other topical preparation. So you have to be very careful when you're using them. All right, we'll move on to ticks. The Ixadi species and the Argicid species are the ones that we most commonly see in uh, dogs and cats. Typically, we see them in dogs and cats that spend a lot of time outdoors or go hiking, but not always. Um, we've had more and more ticks since we've had warmer and warmer weather. Um, so we do have to be aware of them and teach people how to uh, search their animals daily or after they come inside even multiple times a day to look for these guys. Um, they're blood sucking arthropod parasites. They're not host specific, so they will attach to your dog, they'll attach to you, they'll attach to a deer, uh, anything in the area. Um, a heavy infestation can produce anemia in the host. Um, I've seen tick infestation that kills a moose, so they can be very prolific. Um, ticks can also transmit many bacterial, viral, rickettsial, and protozoan diseases, so they're dangerous in that way as well. Lyme disease is one of the diseases that we see. It's a high profile example of a tick-borne disease. We have two main families of ticks, the Ixodidae or our hard ticks and the Argicidae are um, soft ticks. Most of the commonly found ticks belong in the Ixodidae family. We don't see a lot of soft ticks. Um, ticks injure animals by several means. So there's irritation of the actual bite. They're vectors of disease, meaning they carry diseases. And they also inject a neurotoxin uh, in their saliva um, in 12 different Ixodes species. That, and that neurotoxin can actually cause a tick paralysis, which is an ascending, meaning it's, it's from the tip of the tail all the way up. 
it's a flaccid paralysis of dogs. So it can be actually very dangerous. Clinical signs, often we uh, have owners report um, that they see a tick or they see a lump and they're not sure what it is. Uh, we might see weakness or pale mucous membranes if they have large numbers, numbers of ticks. Um, if there's a neurotoxin within the species, you'll see an ascending flaccid paralysis. And sometimes arthritis-like symptoms of lameness, joint and muscle pain, fever uh, in Lyme disease and, and ehrlichia. There are a couple of tick-borne diseases that cause that. Diagnosis is based on finding a tick on the animal. That's the definitive diagnosis. Um, any history of exposure to wooded, grassy areas that are known to have tick infestations suggests the diagnosis. So even if you don't find the tick on the animal, um, if they've been hiking lately and they're showing signs, uh, it's absolutely possible that it's been due to a tick. So obviously we need to remove all of the ticks. We're gonna soak the tick in alcohol. Um, when you take it off, just firmly grasp the head parts. You can use a hemostat. Um, you should never use your bare hands to remove a tick or to crush a tick because the blood within the tick may contain infectious microorganisms organisms that can affect you. You never wanna use a lighted cigarette, a gasoline or kerosene to remove a tick because that's going to cause damage to the animal skin. There are topical treatments, uh, dips, sprays, and powders. Um, paramite dip, pyrethrin dip, Derakil pet dip, um, Adams flea and tick dust, VIP flea and tick powder, Adams flea and tick 14 day mist. Um, so there are a number of products. It's important to remember that um, a lot of the tick medications are a lot more dangerous than the flea medications, and almost every single one of them is highly toxic to cats. Uh, one collar, flea collars in general don't work. They're just not, uh, don't have enough spread uh, for them to be effective on especially larger animals. But a prevent tick collar does actually work. It's the only collar that is effective against ticks um, they're effective for about three months, as long as they don't get wet. Um, Frontline uh, can be used as a spot-on product effective against fleas and ticks. Vant ticks is effective against fleas and ticks. Revolution claims to be effective against fleas and ticks. Um, and there's some environmental um, things that you can use as well to keep um, ticks out of your home and out of your yard. Adam's Home and Kennel Spray, Vet Fog Fogger, Cyphotrol Plus Fogger, Permectrin pet yard and kennel spray. Um, so anything that you can do to remove ticks from the environment, um, remove brush, limit rodents from the area, keep grassy areas cut down, um, just provide areas that are uh, tick free. You wanna routinely check all animals for ticks, um, tell your clients to do the same, especially after they spend some time outside during the spring and summer especially around the ears and between the toes. Those are really common places to find ticks. You want to um, treat the environment to prevent reinfestation of the pets. If you have an, a severe infestation, you may need to call a professional exterminator. Uh, we want to remind our clients that ticks are not species specific and they're going to feed on humans whenever they get the chance and, and they do carry disease. Destroy the outdoor habitat. Um, so open up the space around your house, cut down the, the grass, um, protect your pet with repellent collars and sprays to keep um, ticks and off pets. Mange. Mange uh, is, any, is uh, diseases usually that uh, um, are called, called mange. They're um, produced by mice. So three primary diseases called mange are seen in the dog and cat. The demodectic mange, which this mite here looks like a cigar, and that's demodex. Cercoptic mange, this mite um, looks like a, kind of looks like a tick. It's big and fat with short little legs. And notoedric mange, which we don't see a lot of, uh, but it is common in cats. Um, these are tiny mites living on or in the skin. They produce irritation and inflammation. And the symptoms for each of the diseases are distinct and diagnosis must include identification of the mite through skin scrapings or biopsy. It is relatively easy to find the demodex mite. It becomes much harder to find the scabies mite and the notoedric mite. Part of that is look at their legs. They have 
legs that are longer than these tiny little legs on the demodex mite. Also, the demodex mite lives in follicles, while the cercoptes and the um, notoedric mite live on top of the skin, so they can move very quickly away from where you're scraping. Demodectic mange. Uh, clinical signs of a localized demodex, the animal is almost always a young dog. We're talking three months to one year. When it's found in localized form in adults, the animals have a history of disease earlier in life. Alopecia usually starts around the face, around the eyes, the mouth, and the ears, and the next most frequently involved areas are the forelegs and occasionally the trunk. And a lot of times you will just see a, a, just an area of alopecia, a small area of alopecia. Um, sometimes it's red, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's crusty, sometimes it's not. Um, if it is red and crusty, um, we call that a red mange. Generalized demodex, usually the animals will be febrile, meaning they have a fever. And part of that is just that there's a secondary infection and just so much activity within the skin, creating um, a fever within the body, an inflammatory response. The entire body surface will be involved and you'll get secondary bacterial skin infections with pustules. And here you see a dog with demodectic mange that is all throughout the body. So Demodex canis is a cigar-shaped mite. It lives within the hair follicles of most dogs and some cats. These mites spend their entire life cycle on the host. In most dogs, the immune system holds the number of mites in check unless they are immunosuppressed. Animals are typically non-pruritic. That means they are not itching. It's an important distinguishing uh, characteristic to help differentiate de demodectic mange from other types of mange. Diagnosis is by mite identification. So we do a skin scraping. How do we do a skin scraping? What we do is we take a drop of mineral oil um, on the lesion, or you can put the drop of, of mineral oil directly onto a slide, a microscopic slide. Um, then we're going to um, firmly scrape while squeezing the skin. And we're actually going to create a little abrasion on the skin. So I always tell owners this spot is going to look worse before it looks better because I'm going to need to get down to a surface where I get a little bit of blood. Um, we're going to transfer the material to a clean glass slide and examine it under a microscope. Like I said, these guys are easily seen. Once we see it, there are certain things that we don't want to do, and we'll get to that in the next slide. Um, we may need to do a culture and sensitivity of the skin lesions if we are also seeing a secondary bacterial infection is present. Treatment. Treatment depends on the age of the patient, the extent of the lesions, and your veterinarian's um, present, preference. Um, rotenone, also known as Goodwinol ointment or Canex, um, we can apply that to the localized lesions daily, and it um, does, uh, does a fairly good job of removing, removing the demodex in that area. Also, what, what helps is if the immune system of the animal is improved and they can fight that um, Demodex might a little bit better. If we have a generalized or a very severe localized um, Demodex infestation, mitoban dips using Amitraz, uh, we may have to clip the, the dog completely to remove all the hair. We bathe the entire animal with a mild soap and then towel dry them. And then we will mix up a dilution, uh, one bottle with two gallons of water typically, um, and we will just continuously pour it on them until we get through the entire two gallons. Um, we don't rinse or towel dry the animal. Uh, we use three to six treatments uh, sometimes. Each treatment's two weeks apart or 14 days apart. And we're going to continue it until skin scrapings are negative. Ivermectin is a, another medication that we use. Um, we use it uh, on label or we, it's labeled for use for heartworm, but we know that it does affect other uh, parasites. So in this case, it is used off-label, meaning that it wasn't tested for this, but we know it works. Um, clients must re re sign a release form that we're using it because it is off-label. And we, what we usually need to do is increase, give them a small dose and gradually increase it until it's at the effective dose of 600 micrograms per kilogram a day. We're going to treat them for at least 30 days or after we get two negative skin scrapes two weeks apart. So 
We're going to be scraping them every two weeks, increasing the dose every day, um, and we're going to uh, get them to an effective dose of 600 micrograms per kilogram for at least 30 days. Interceptor is a um, ivermectin. I'm sorry, it's a milbamycin drug. Um, it's a heartworm drug, and we can administer it monthly for a minimum of 90 days. It's um, easy to administer, um, and it is something that also gets um, heartworms, and so it, it's a good option. Oral antibiotics may be needed if we have secondary bacterial infection. Plain info. Many animals will outgrow mange as they age. As they get a better immune system, their immune system is able to fight off that uh, mange mite. Hemodex is not contagious to humans or other animals. Treatment will never completely remove the mites from the skin, but the goal is to reduce the number of mites on the animal and improve the general health of the pet. You should know that 98% of the population of humans also have Demodex mites. They usually live in our eyebrows. Um, so that's something you might think about. Um, you, may, you may be one of those. You probably are one of those uh, people that have Demodex mites in their eyebrows. And it doesn't hurt, and you don't notice it. Um, so a lot of times, we, we can live with Demodex. We can live with these parasites, and it's not a problem. Treatment can be prolonged in some animals. Sometimes it takes a while to get rid of this. Um, sometimes the generalized form can be fatal in some animals. Um, it is really important, and I'll go back up to here, that we do not give them anything that might further immunosuppress the animal. That includes steroid, uh, and very often um, veterinarians will grab steroids if we have a skin condition that we want to reduce any itching. Um, if we have an animal with uh, Demodex, if we give steroids, we can actually make them much worse to the point where it may be fatal. So giving steroids with Demodex is absolutely malpractice. We wouldn't want to do that. However, if they have a scabies or a scar sarcoptic mange, it's very pruritic. It's very contagious. One of the things that does help, um, not only treating for the mite, but also treating for the itching because that itching and that scratching can bring in a secondary uh, bacteria. The mite is Sarcoptis scabii variation canis and has a rounded body with four pairs of little stubby legs. The female mite will burrow into the epidermis and lay eggs, and it's that burrowing that produces intense itching and inflammation within the skin. Scabies can occur in dogs of any age, sex, or breed, and humans may experience development of visible lesions after exposure to infected animals. However, the mites do not survive off the animal host for longer than a few days. So if the owner experiences development of small red papules on his or her skin, they need to contact their medical doctor. But it is self-limiting, and within 10 days, usually those signs go away. So it is a zoonotic disease, but it's a self-limiting zoonotic disease. Um, here you can see the zoonosis on a human, and this is what it looks like in, a, in dogs severely affected by scabies. You will see red crusty lesions that are usually start on the ears, the elbows, and sometimes elsewhere on the trunk of the animal. It is intensely, intensely pruritic. They cannot stop itch, itching, not even for one second in the exam room. They may say hi to you and go back immediately to, to itching their skin uh, or scratching their skin. Um, the, this distinguishes it from Demodex. There are almost always is a secondary bacterial skin, um, uh, bacterial skin infection because of the self-trauma. Um, the disease will progressively become more severe. Uh, identification of the mite uh, is through skin scrapings, but these are very difficult to find. Um, they move around very um, uh, quickly, and they're located deep in the epidermis. So we have to get them, uh, get the female mite, we need to go very deep, um, even deeper than Demodex. We're going to do multiple scrapings of the same animal um, around, all around their body, if we want to locate one mite. Sometimes, though, we can see mites on skin biopsies. Scabies treatment, remove the mites. Um, typically, we can use dips. Um, a paramite dip. Uh, we can also use ivermectin, and this is, a, we can give sub-Q or paros, and we use it um, once, and we treat it again in 14 days. With Demodex, we're using it daily. 
Um, in ivermectin, we give it once and then again in 14 days. We could use paramite dust um, as another treatment, but we can't use it in puppies that are younger than 12 weeks. Uh, to tell your client, you need to tell your client it's a highly contagious disease among dogs. Humans frequently experience uh, development of visible lesions, small red papules, and they need to contact their physician if this occurs. Mites do not remain on the human for longer than a few hours. If they do bur burrow in, there are limiting reactions. Your, your immune system typically will take care of it within 10 days. We can see a similar disease in cats, but the mite's not the same. The mite is Nota edri's uh, cat eye. Um, usually, uh, that's the sarcoptic mange mite that we see in uh, cats or notoedric mite that we see in cats. The dog mite rarely infects the cats. Species variants of the sarcoptic mite infest almost all species of haired animals. One other interesting thing to say about notoedry's cat eye, because cats are very good at grooming, often diagnosis of that mite is found in a fecal examination. So we'll actually see the mite in the feces. So if you see a mite in the feces, don't say, oh, I don't know how that got in the feces. That actually could be a, an indication of a skin disease. Warbles. Warbles are the general term for this hypoderma species of fly that lay eggs in soil. Um, the eggs mature into a larval stage similar to a grub that directly penetrates the host skin. Uh, it's uh, found in a subcutaneous pocket and the larva uh, continues to mature, finally leaving the wound to become an adult fly. What you'll see is this little breathing hole. It's a fistula or opening in a swelling that allows the larvae to breathe while maturing. You can see the larvae moving up and down in the opening to the fistula. The disease is often seen in young puppies, kittens, and rabbits. Owners may notice a large swelling behind the ears on the neck or around the face. In rabbits, the lesion can sometimes even be in the nasal cavity. The swelling has an opening or a fistula through which the larvae can be seen. Uh, what we need to do is to open the fistula uh, even more, incise it, and then use a curved mosquito hemostat, which is a tool that we use, to carefully remove the intact larva. We don't want to crush it or tear it because any release of the larval protein can cause an immediate allergic reaction in the host. We can then flush the wound out with diluted povidone um, iodine or betadine solution or a chlorhexidine solution, also known as Nolvasan. Oral or topical antibiotics may be needed to combat skin, uh, secondary skin infection. We want to keep young animals in clean, fly-free areas to avoid infection. We can use fly repellent gels to help prevent the disease around the ears and around the neck. Um, even after the larva, that heat wound may heal slowly. Part of the problem is that it is a completely round um, wound and round wounds don't tend to heat, heal quickly because the skin, uh, the, the lesion continues to heal in a round um, form. If it were squared off or you incised it, it would actually heal a little bit quicker um, because the uh, edges of the skin can actually come together. Maggots or myasis. Um, many adult forms of di dipterous flies often deposit eggs on wet, warm, or damaged skin of animals. These eggs will hatch into larvae known as maggots, which are highly destructive, producing punched out areas in the skin and these lesions often coalesce to form even larger ulcerated areas. Large numbers of maggots may be found in wounds that have been gone unnoticed by ant, uh, owners. Um, often we see this in cases where we have heavy coats, matted fur, and neglect um, of these animals. And that's going to pre predispose it. If I had smell vision I would let you smell uh, this wound. Um, maggots smell really, really badly. Um, and it's something you'll never forget once you smell it. So owners will often report that we have a matted hair, a bad odor, or a very painful reaction when you pet the animal in this area. And then you, you start to find the magnets. To treat it, we need to clip the hair from all the lesions and flush those areas with uh, copious amounts of water. We need to remove all of the larvae. Um, we need to then clean the wound daily and treat with um, uh, sometimes topical antibiotics. Often we have to give them oral antibiotics, something with good spectrum, meaning that it's going to kill um, whatever bacteria might be living in or, or among the skin. 
uh, Keflex, Ceflexin, and triple sulfas are um, some of the uh, drugs that we'll use. Um, if we can keep the pet indoors to prevent reinfestation, that is what we'll need to do. Uh, this is a difficult thing because myasis is a disease of neglect. The owners really need to be educated um, to treat their outdoor pets frequently or to check them frequently, especially during summer months when flies are out and about. If we have heavy coated animals, if we need to clip them or, or groom them during the hot, humid summer months so we can avoid damage to the skin. Um, we want to avoid using toxic dip, dips or sprays on the wounds to remove the larvae because it'll actually damage the skin even further and damage the, the uh, pet. If we can keep pets indoors during peak fly hours to prevent infestations, so usually early in the morning and late in the afternoon is when uh, flies are out and about. And then we want to um, treat the outdoor environment, um, keep it clean to avoid attracting flies. Lice. Lice are host specific and spend all their lives on that host. They're found in debilitated, dirty, and ill-kept animals and are also commonly seen on poultry and pigeons. Lice is a disease of neglect. It's important to remember that. Um, so it's another education point for the clients. Pets may become ill-tempered and agitated because of the presence of lice. It's constantly chewing or sucking on them. It um, it's, promotes intense itching. And also blood sucking lice can cause anemia. The difference between these two lice can be seen here. On the right side, we have a thin head. On the left side, we have a thick head. This is a chewing or biting lice, it has thick mandibles. Um, this is a sucking louse, uh, which has a, um, a tube that can, can ins be inserted into the skin to suck blood. Presence of lice or nits on the hair coat is diagnostic. Um, this is an example of what you might see on a hair coat. Treatment, you wanna treat all animals in the house or all species specific animals. Or, um, animals of the same species in the house. We're gonna use an insecticide dip, shampoo, or dust. Clip all the hair on the animal, bathe with a good shampoo, and then treat with an insecticide dip, dust, or spray. All bedding and grooming tools must be washed thoroughly. We can use ivermectin again. We can use it orally, but it is off-label, so we need to get a signed release uh, from the owner. Humans cannot get lice from the pets, and pets cannot get lice from humans. Remember, it's species-specific. Uh, we wanna clean the environment to prevent reinfestation, and we want to improve the coat care of the pet by including routine bathing and grooming. Here's uh, that example of that sucking louse um, and the associated knit on the hair shaft. This is what we can see microscopically. Knits, if we see them macroscopically or with our eye, um, they're oval, white, uh, and usually found cemented to the hair shaft. Fungal infections, superficial dermatomycoses. Um, infections by fungal elements usually occur when the dermatophyte penetrates the skin and begins to proliferate on the surface of the hair shaft. Three species of fungi typically cause disease in the dog and cat, Microsporum gypsium, Trichophyton mentagophytes, and Microsporum canis. Microsporum canis is the most commonly isolated derm dermatophyte of dogs and cats. This fungus may pr also produce lesions in humans, so it's zoonotic. Infections are usually the result of contact with the organism, and young or debilitated animals appear to be most susceptible. The fungus produces enzymes that result in hypertrophy of the surrounding epidermis. Lesions become scaly with excessive keratin. So we have round, scaly lesions with the outside of the lesion is typically red, so it kind of looks like a bullseye. So microsporum canis infections, clinical signs are the appearance of a rapidly growing circular patch of alopecia. Some areas will be red, raised, and crusty. Uh, lesions are most frequently seen on the face and head. Sometimes the hairs in the lesion appear to be broken and they are easily epilated, E-P-I-L-L-A-T-E-D, epilated. Um, that means that the hair it easily comes out of the lesion it's not well held into the follicle because it is um, infected by, um, by the fungus. Pet owners can actually have similar lesions on themselves as well. There is a, a way you can diagnose it by using a black light or a woods light uh, examination. 
what you can see is um, that the infected hair shafts will fluoresce an apple green color. Approximately 50% of microsporum canis organisms will fluoresce on examination. So if you see it, you know that the, there's um, a microsporum. But if you don't see it, because in 50% of the um, cases, you won't see uh, dermatophyte fluorescing. Um, so the, the hair shaft does glow a yellow green or an apple green under the ultraviolet light. But we have to remember that ointments and creams applied topically can also fluoresce. So that could be a pos false positive result. You want to make sure that that is completely clean um, lesion. We can use a potassium hydroxide uh, slide preparation. You just put a couple of hairs on and a skin scraping on a clean microscope and add some 10% potassium hydroxide. Uh, and you can look for fungal elements. You can also culture, and this is probably what's most commonly done. We, we do a culture in the um, clinic. Um, we uh, Funguses always grow slow, so sometimes it's 10 to 14 days before you'll see anything. Um, these are some examples of some cultures. Uh, there are products called fung, fung assay and sab du, duets. DTM assays are also a, another uh, culture you can get. Um, and often there's a color change, um, there's a chemical within the agar, which will produce a color change uh, when it comes into contact with dermatophyte colonies. Um, once we have growth, um, we check these cultures every day. And once we have growth, um, we want to take a, a tape sample. So we take a piece of scotch tape and we put the sticky side on that growth and then put a drop of uh, sediment stain on the slide and put that um, piece of tape over top of that sediment stain. And you can actually look at the fungal growth and look at the spores, and that will help you diagnose what kind of fungus is growing. Um, what we do is we take plucked hairs. We use a clean or sterile uh, hemostat or tweezers to pluck hairs from the surface of the, um, of the lesion or the edges of the lesion, or scales, or nails. You can also put nails in this uh, assay or in this medium. We're going to label that medium. We're going to turn it upside down because there's condensation that occurs, and we don't want the condensation to land on the medium. Um, we then put it in a dark, um, warm, not, not super warm, but a you know, uh, 72 degrees out of the way area, usually in a cabinet, and we're going to check it every day. Um, for treatment, we're going to clip the affected areas. So we're going to remove the contaminated hair shafts. We then need to decontaminate those clippers. And we can treat the local areas twice daily with some topical antifungal medications. We're going to continue for about two weeks after the lesion's clear because fungus can stay within the skin or within the follicles for some time. We can use myconazole, trezoderm, my, um, well, several different types of myconazole, lotrimin, clotrimazole, a dilute Clorox solution, um, a dilute betadine solution, uh, those kind of things will all help to um, kill the fungus. We can, with a generalized treatment, we can bathe the animal in a medicated shampoo, such as Novasan, and treat the entire body with antifungal preparations, so topical um, treatment. Um, we can treat them once or twice a week until the cultures are negative. Sometimes it takes four to 16 weeks. Fungus is like to hold on. There's Lime Dip, which is a um, product that can be used to treat this, um, the fungus. Nolvasan, Betadine, Clorox. Um, we can use Fluconazole or Ketoconazole orally. Uh, those medications are antifungal. Um, dermatophyte is ringworm. Ringworm is a zoonotic disease. Um, the other oral um, uh, therapies we can use are Griseofulvin, uh, Griseofulvin uh, microsize or suspension. Use, like I said, ketoconazole. Um, you want to make note of the side effects of these things vomiting, diarrhea, griseofulvin will cause abortion in pregnant animals. Um, with ketoconazole, depression, anorexia, vomiting, diarrhea, um, and jaundice uh, can cause some liver disease, liver damage. Um, M. canis, uh, microsporum canis, there is a vaccine if you have adult cats that are uh, carriers of this fungus. Um, the vaccine is given in three doses, two doses at 14-day intervals with a third 28 days after the second dose. So it's administered a little differently than other vaccines. It doesn't completely eliminate microsporum canis from the animal, but it will help to 
treat the disease of microsporum uh, canis. They won't have as a big of a, uh, the, the symptoms and the signs of the disease. Clients need to know that microsporum canis infection is contagious through contact with the organism. Fungal hairs can remain in, infective on shed hairs of the animal for as long as 18 months. We need to also clean the environment to prevent reinfe reinfection. Carpets and furniture need to be vacuumed weekly with the bag being discarded each time or the canister being rinsed out. If there's a hard surface that we can clean with Clorox solution or an sand solution, we want to do that. Um, if we can't clean uh, an area, repaint it. Any toys or equipment that aren't easily cleaned, we, wouldn't, we need to get rid of. We want to handle infected animals as little as possible. Some cats may be carriers of fungal infection while not exhibiting any clinical signs. This has happened to me. I had a dog that was constantly getting reinfected with dermatophyte. I kept treating her, treating her, treating her. I finally tested my cat, found that the cat was um, carrying the fungal infection and reinfecting the dog. So I treated the cat and the dog and we got rid of the problem. Uh, remind them that they do need to see their own doctor if they see lesions on themselves or their family members. We're gonna take a break here uh, and we're gonna start this lecture uh, with a part two in the next broadcast. <laughs>